Well, a very uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome back. I hope you've had a good uh, coffee break, and thank you for joining us all this morning at uh, today's City UK annual conference. Um, Miles, thank you very much for the introduction. As Miles said, I'm Chris Hayward, the Deputy Chairman of the City UK Board and also the Policy Chairman, which in modern parlance means the political leader of the City of London Corporation, and I've got the privilege of chairing this session uh, for you this morning. Uh, I'm delighted that we've got a stellar panel for this session, featuring four leading voices who I'll introduce to you shortly to discuss the really fundamentally important question of attracting green investment into the UK. The way I intend to chair this session is it will feature two rounds of questions from me as the <coughs> chair to the panellists uh, before turning to you for audience questions. So do please submit them if you want to in advance on your apps and they'll come through to me on the iPad or alternatively I'll look out as we did in the, the first panel session this morning and try and take uh, questioners from, from the floor. But now let me briefly introduce the topics before meeting uh, our fantastic lineup of speakers. I'm sure and I hope we can all agree that the climate crisis is the biggest, perhaps the greatest challenge confronting us today and there's certainly been plenty of discussion on this topic this week because of course it is London Climate Action Week and we know all of us in this room the destination we must reach net zero as soon as possible but certainly by 2050 to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial levels but of course the big question is how do we get there and at the City of London Corporation, we believe that green finance is one of the best tools available to policymakers in the urgent race to meet climate targets. But even with uh, green finance, there is still plenty of work to do. So today our panel will explore the policy approaches required, including taxonomy, to deliver the government's green finance strategy and incentivise investment into the United Kingdom. So let's now meet our panel of experts. Uh, firstly, uh, Coco, Coco Agbo Blua was appointed Global Head of Economics, Cross Asset and Quant Research in June 2020, in addition to his role as Head of Flow Strategy and Solutions at Societe, Societe Generale. Welcome to you, Coco. Uh, Sasha Sedan, uh, on the far end, is the Director of ESG at the FCA facilitating the UK financial regulator to embed ESG across the wide spectrum of regulatory activity, activities. Steph, Steph Betts is Head of Alliances, Coalitions and Reporting for Aon's Climate Team and is a senior member of the Governance Committee of Women in Banking and Finance. Welcome to you. And finally, on my right, Jen Huitan is Global Head of Stewardship and Sustainable Investing for Fidelity International and chairs the firm's Sustainable Investing Operating Committee. So welcome to our panel this morning. I'm going to start, if I may, first of all, to a question uh, to Coco, Stephanie and Jen Huey. So the three of you, if I may. The Chancellor's indicated that he will be setting out the UK's response to the United States Inflation Reduction Act at the Autumn Statement. So what would be your top policy suggestions to the Chancellor today to ensure that the UK continues to attract green investment in an increasingly competitive international environment? S ladies first. Steph, shall I start with you? Oh, gosh, I didn't expect to go first. <laughs> um, but thank you anyway, and thank you for your introduction. Um, so I think for me, the, uh, when I look at policy, the idea would be what you really need is the three Cs. You need clarity first. You need consistency, and certainly for what we're trying to achieve, we need circularity. So these are the three uh, big points that, you know, the three big characteristics that the policy from the government should have in order to be as impactful as what we've seen uh, in the state in particular. So I, when I thought about this topic, I thought there's actually two broad agendas. One of, the first one is just housekeeping. Um, and in housekeeping, I'd put things like, look, first of all, there's, there's two main points, housing, before we talk about innovation and, and new source of energy, et cetera, the first thing we need to do is actually think about where we are wasting energy. And the biggest problem I think we are facing in terms of transition is 
potentially, probably, the real estate, very old real estate, which is leaking energy all the time. So that's probably one of the priorities that the government should look at. And I know heat pumps aren't as exciting as you know, uh, electric cars, but they need to make it more so. So that's probably one of the things. And you can think about practical solutions. It doesn't need to be very complicated. We've got farmers in this country who can't sell their wool for love nor money. That's perfect insulation. You know, we've got landfills full of clothes. You shred them. Again, that's perfect insulation. So I'm not exactly a qualified in building. I want to say that right away. Uh, but I think we need to think in terms of practical and circular, circular solution. The second point is tech. And obviously, for innovation, you need sandboxes. You need a government that helps startups to get started. And actually, this country has a phenomenal rec record in terms of a startup, even versus California, versus the Silicon Valley. Uh, we apparently have more startups than in the States, but our problem is the scaling up. And this is where the government needs to support entrepreneurs a lot more. And then I'll do a little plug on diversity. I don't like that word. But um, if you think that the end customers are the whole population, which is made of 50% men and 50% women approximately, when you look at the amount of funding that goes into women's business, in particular from the VC side of things, you're talking about 2%. That's very small. That's, you know, these sort of things need to be addressed one way or another. And I think that will help innovation because innovation comes from, you know, diverse point of views, from, you know, really understanding what customers, what the market wants. And if you ignore 50% of the market, you're probably not going to make as much money as you could. So let's just put it in money terms, not in terms of diversity, but what is going to make money, what is going to make sense for the financial sector. So that's my two first housekeeping points. This, and my last point is, second point is the mindset. So we've got housekeeping, and then we've got mindset um, transformation. So the first one is we need to realize and really understand and help people understand that supply chains hold the cards to everything in terms of climate. If we do not talk about supply chains, we cannot really reasonably believe that we're going to uh, address the crisis. Supply chains are accountable for 90% of, uh, of all externalities beyond just emissions. So that's really the focal point. And I think if we can transform that from a negative into a positive and help companies see that supply chains are actually the engine of their resilience, the engine of competitiveness for them as well. And companies need to look at circularity again there and everything from the soil where the first step is, you know, the commodities are extracted, um, to the processing, the packaging, the transport, how they can, you know, minimize the cost and impact. So that's really important. Um, so supply chains are everything, and we need to change our mindset about those, um, and, and we'll figure out that they're an incre incredible asset, and the UK could certainly take a lead on that once again. And then my final point is on collaboration. Everybody talks about collaboration, but it's collaboration across the board, and we're going to need to step on it now, big time, because you know, we, we've seen the curve, we're not going down, we're still looking at 2.9, we're far, far, far from the 1.5. So the two types of collaboration I'd like to talk about are obviously public and private partnership, we talk about that all the time. Less common is collaboration across industry. So you could see the food, food sector talking to the aviation sector to help build, you know, a system for sustainable aviation fuel, for instance. You could talk about fashion and uh, fast fashion and, uh, and food talking about you know, extractive industries and how they could come together and help each other um, to find solutions. And then finally, engaging the consumer. You know, we, need, we certainly in finance need to demystify what we do. We all like to sound really clever, like we do something really complicated, but it's not really true, and we all know it. We need to make it easier to understand for the common public so they can back us, we can rebuild the trust that we've lost in 2008. Um, and I think it's really important that we engage them and we we explain clearly what we are trying to do, and we need to make the consumer at the center of what we plan and design. So the government needs to do that, because the consumer will vote with their feet, with their wallets. That will impact the companies. It's that simple. So if we want to win, we need to win the hearts of the consumer first and make them feel excited and, and uplifted by the transition. I know it's a tough ask, but we can do this. Steph, thanks very much indeed. Koku, what are your messages to the Chancellor? Um, one of my favorite quotes is that of uh, the great philosopher Mike Tyson, uh, who once said, um, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> um, so I think when it comes to climate change, uh, we see uh, the facts. We are nowhere near where we need to be. 
Um, but I think it's important to put the numbers into perspective. The planet today emits 54 billion tons of CO2 equivalent every year. We have emitted since 1850 2,500 billion tons of CO2. To, of, to reach uh, 1.5, we need to limit the cumulative emissions to 3,000 billion tons of CO2 by 2050. So we have 500 billion tons left. And at 54 billion tons per year, we will get there at, uh, within 10 years, less than 10 years. So when it comes to the UK, I think it's important for, for the Chancellor to sort of look at the objective, which is CO2. So the UK emits 420 million tons of CO2 equivalent. This is 0.8% of the total global emissions. So it's not a big number, but it's important that the UK gets to net zero and then contributes uh, with the rest of the world. So 420 million tons of CO2 to go to zero. So if you look at the breakdown, you have 26% that is in the transport industry, 20% in energy, uh, then you have businesses, that's around 18%, uh, and then you have the housing sector, that's around 16%, and then agriculture and food, 11 12%. So I think the plan needs to be holistic and look at all of these contribution uh, sectors that contribute to emissions and have clear uh, plans that are um, in terms of level playing field, in terms of taxonomy, to make sure that uh, businesses and investors have transparency, but also are able to see the full picture uh, and uh, work with other jurisdictions because the EU, for example, is around three to four billion tons of CO2 uh, and the UK alone uh, is not going to get there by itself. So a plan that should be uh, holistic in terms of the key sectors, making level playing fields in terms of regulation and also working with our peers uh, because CO2 does not have a nationality. Um, it's a global problem, and we're all uh, failing uh, miserably to, to get there. So uh, action uh, is the priority. Thank you. Thanks, Koku, very much indeed. Jen Huey, what are your thoughts? Maybe I'll take an, uh, the opposite tack from that sort of global perspective. I think the way I'll sort of frame my comments is around what does it take for the UK to stand out in a very competitive landscape for, the, for green investment? a lot of countries around the world are trying to do exactly what the UK is trying to do. So what is it about the UK and what can the Chancellor do to help to create the right conditions for that investment to flow here rather than other financial centers? And I guess the first one of those things I think is reinforcing or maybe reestablishing the UK's climate leadership. Um, and I'm gonna ignore the recent headlines. I, I'm, I'm just gonna sort of hark back to 2021 when we had COP26 and the sort of bold commitments that were made, the initiatives that were launched that resonated at the global level. And I think to some degree, that's part of what I would encourage the Chancellor, Chancellor to think about. So an example of that would be a government-wide transition plan with granular, strong sectoral pathways. And that's a very hard thing to do. It's very easy to lay a claim out there. It's very hard to lay your actual pathway for how you get there. But that's the work that shows how committed the UK is on this pathway. So not, you don't just ban boilers, but you show how you're going to invest in skills and development. You show how you're going to invest in new emerging technologies. You show your deployment of heat pumps, your R&D on insulation, so on and so forth. So I think that's the first piece. The second is around incentives. Now, I think, you know, acknowledging that Chancellor Hunt's fiscal room to maneuver is maybe not as uh, wide as President Biden and that mass incentives like we saw with the IRA are not um, necessarily po uh, possible. I think you can still have very targeted, smart incentives in the things that matter, like grid or storage, or in the emerging technologies like hydrogen or CCUS, where the, um, the UK does have a, have a technological um, uh, edge. And then finally, I think continued regulatory reform. Maybe some people call this kind of trying to get regulation a little bit better positioned. So I'm thinking here about planning and permitting for um, renewable power projects, particularly I think onshore and offshore wind. I'm thinking about mechanisms that embed climate across all levels of the government. So the net zero uh, delivery unit. I'm thinking about the work that Sasha is doing around the greening of the financial system. 
which I'm sure we'll talk about, which is already uh, uh, turning the UK into a competitive centre uh, for, for financial services um, uh, in this space. So I think that would be how I would position my remarks to him. Thanks very much. So, Jenny, you've just mm. talked about sort of smart, targeted, low-cost ways to attract green investment. Before I come on to you, Sasha, and I'm going to on a slightly different subject in a moment, just for the other two panellists' point of view, I think many would agree that probably the UK can't win the subsidy battle with the USA. So picking up on that issue, which Jenny was talking about, do you have any thoughts as well on low-cost, targeted ways to attract green investment, smart ones? Um, I think if you look at the, the UK, it's uh, 2.2 trillion in GDP. The US is roughly 20, 20, well, 25 trillion dollars. So I think size and scale makes a difference. Um, the amount of financing that's required, according to a report in, uh, by the OBR, is around 320 billion uh, uh, pounds uh, uh, by sort of uh, on a net basis, but that's roughly 1.4 trillion uh, a sterling by net uh, by 2050. So I think um, having a, a setup where you have public uh, and private cooperation um, and have, I like the argument around, uh, we live in a globalized uh, world, so a lot of the green energy uh, have a whole supply chain and dynamic. Um, and, and I think that's where you could uh, reduce the cost by mechanism in the financing structures um, that a lot of financial institutions have developed to create a, a positive feedback loop where uh, the return on, on these investments uh, attract additional investments and you get more uh, scalable uh, projects. Steph? Yeah, and I'd back this up. I think what we need to look at is a leverage, you know, how the UK can leverage what it's got already, which is extraordinary um, set of, you know, we've got amazing education, we've got amazing scientists. Uh, I think we bat really hard in that. Sorry. I say we, but yeah. uh, we but really hard in that in that respect, and I think it's it's really choosing our battles as well in terms of investment and in terms of support of the industries. Um, and as Kukri was saying, I think it's just focusing on the battles we think we can win and have a global leadership in, rather than having a scatter approach. Um, and as we talked about earlier as well, is that sort of clarity of the pathway towards net zero. And it's showing leadership in that, which hopefully will help the others do the same, because it, it is doable, we just need to be methodical. So smart at the beginning, assess what the landscape is, where we can win, look at how we'll get you know, all these benefits as a, like a domino effect throughout an entire supply chain, a chosen supply chain or a few chosen supply chain, and just really go hard on those and win there. I think for me that would be the way. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Sasha. I'm going to turn to you. I haven't forgotten you, honestly. Let's, let's <laughs> talk to the regulator. How can you forget the regulator? How can you forget <laughs> the regulator? We certainly can't. With the geo geopolitical landscape creating increased competition for green capital, many are looking to the Chancellor in his autumn statement to apply policy levers to incentivise green investment in the UK. We've just been talking about that. But what is the role of the regulator in helping to ensure the UK is a global hub for green finance? Hi, everyone, and it's nice to be back again. Um, so I've been, as you know, a financial PLC. I've been an asset manager, been an asset owner, and nearly for two years been a financial regulator. So there's lots we can do. But the most important thing we need to do is try and be a bit pragmatic and streetwise, which, again, is very important, rather than just nice, big, grandiose statements. So fantastic news that on Monday, only 20 months after COP26, and when Nick Ilvati and... Uh, the Chancellor at the time said they were going to launch ISSB and help it. It got launched in 20 months. That is a world record in accounting. Amazing. Absolute world record. One st standard internationally on sustainability metrics that we can all compare. And the FCA has been pushing very hard for that and helping internationally. Even when people go, oh, I like bits of it, I don't like other bits. It's our job to help make sure there's one standard so it's consistency, credibility, and all of the things that you should know. Done and that will happen, and then the UK will hopefully take a lead like it did with TCFD reporting. Secondly, you, transition plans, one of the most pragmatic things. It was announced at COP26, again, using the London Stock Exchange, Unilever, Eviva, NatWest, using industry to say, how do we get net zero transition plans up and running? And the FCA's had a digital sandbox with them to give them a chance to try and see what works. Guidance statements help but you must start, if you're going to say things like, I'm signing up to net zero for 2050, can you please tell me how you're going to get there, please? 
for your investors, your owners. And that will be world leading. And more importantly, it's been with people like GFANTS and all of that so that they can use this in other countries. So again, consistency. But will we be last? No, we'll be first. Mm. But using, and it's got in the guidance statement, just so you know, that the companies are using, it says the word ISSB, International Standard, 29 times. So again, we're trying to keep this safe and global rather than UK. And then last but not least, you've heard from Sheldon already before, who I work very closely with. We're, we're doing things like we had 40 chief risk officers of big financially regulated companies. And where are the blockers? So not where do you want more rules, where do you want us to unblock or help? And with the CMA, we're working on net zero collaboration you talked about. It's okay to collaborate. You're not going to solve these massive risks if you have to do it on your own. But how could a regulator? And one of them, just an example, that um, has been with many others, investors said, we'd like to invest in pension schemes, illiquid assets. And so we've unblocked that, with 10% being allowed in defined contribution schemes to be in, in, in some of those great solutions that the people have had. And the FCA has helped make that happen. So pragmatic solutions rather than just grandiose statements. But it is up to the industry. Thanks very much. I'm going to move on to a sort of second round of questions. I'm going to stay with you, though, Sasha, uh, if I may. Um, one concern that is often raised regarding the transition to net zero is greenwashing uh, and the detrimental impact this has on trust and integrity uh, of markets. Is the solution to this problem exclusively regulatory? Uh, and what work is the FCA undertaking to support companies and give consumers confidence in the products on offer? Well, the, the obvious answer, of course it's not. Nothing is exclu <laughs> exclusively regulation, I don't think, or not many things. But one of the things is when we did our consultation just on our, our SDR and labelling work, we've had 240 people and we've had many responses. We do need some guardrails. We want some knowing this. So it's very interesting to have a regulator being asked to get involved. But where do we play? Like we just said with ISSB, let's use some global standards so people can know what whether someone is doing a good job or a bad job and they can be consistently compared. And that's where we can help. Obviously, we're doing a lot of consumer testing now because I think you mentioned consumer. Consumers don't understand transition. Transition to what is what they keep saying to us. So we're saying words like improve. <laughs> oh, I understand that. So we've got to make sure we speak their language because finance is for them. So I think those are the things that we've got to do. But then, of course, industry's got to do its bit. We know it was very exciting. Everyone signed up to net zero commitments. In fact, it was a real rush. But you know how hard it is to go to net zero? <laughs> it's really hard. And now people are realising how hard it is. So I think we need a bit more humility about how we're going to get there rather than big grandiose statements. And I think the regulator has to help. But also say, if you're going to make these commitments, you need to show a plan of getting there. And that's where we play a role in that. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn back to my three non-regulators, if I can put it that way. Um, to, to each of you, really, is, is there a moral or ethical imperative on companies to avoid greenwashing? And how big a problem do you really believe it is? Oh, I'd love to take that one. Go on. Thank Steph, you. You go first. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I'm going to give a big, uh, I'd like a big round of applause, actually, for the regulator, because they've done an amazing job. I was wow. at, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, it was, um, so thank you on your behalf. And it was, it was really interesting this morning. So just quickly harking back to Julia Hoggett, who said that regulating is more an art than a science. And I thought, yes, that's really interesting because obviously it has to be iterative and we're going into the unknown. So you have a very difficult task of taking us all by the hand and helping us get there. The easy bit, as I've discussed with Carney a couple of years ago, is to sign up to net zero. Yeah. yeah, that's the easy bit. Everybody can do that. The challenge is to move forward. So how do you move forward? And I think people forget. They think that they're held to perfection. You're not. You're just held to integrity, transparency, which will build trust. So tell us, you know, tell us, tell investors, tell everybody, tell your stakeholders where you are in your journey. How, what are the challenges you're facing? What are your hopes about the transition? You know, just talk about your real issues. Just be transparent about them. Yep. And there's a lot of you know, safe harboring around all of this. This is what the regulator wants. And the other thing I've come across in, in various roles as in asset management and elsewhere is people get bogged down by what they call the alphabet soup. But in fact, the regulators, and again, the IFRS and the ISSB, sorry, have done an amazing job at talking to other regulators, at engaging, you know, deeply with the SEC to make sure people will have one set of metrics to make life easier for everyone. Um, but we need to think outside the box, not just ticking box. So obviously it's very hard to tick box if you 
are contorting yourself to fit into the regulation. But if you look beyond the actual request from the regulation, you think about what the regulator wants. Where do they want you to go? They just want the corporates to say, to assess their risk and say, you know, what are my externalities? What are my vulnerabilities versus climate or obviously very soon nature? This, and that's all there is to it. So if you can frame your disclosure in those terms, this, the actual disclosure becomes really easy under any set of rules. And I think that's what we want to, I'd like to see people moving more towards that, towards feeling less constrained by the regulation, less constrained by reaching perfection, but much more aiming for um, transparency and integrity about the journey, about the ups and downs of the journey. And I think that will benefit um, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, yep. Koko, um, your um, thoughts? Okay, I'm going to uh, use another quote um, from Einstein this time, uh, which says there are similar to Tyson. You're just too clever. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, and that's actually with re regards to greenwashing. He, he actually said there are two things that are infinite the size of the universe and human stupidity. And he was not convinced by the size <laughs> of the universe. Um, so this is simply to say one thing. I think when it comes to greenwashing and energy transition, etc., you have two very powerful forces at, um, that are in conflict, greed and green. In other words, businesses need to make money, and this is the lifeblood of their, of their um, mission statements, et cetera. Um, and transitioning is hard, but it is also expensive uh, in, in the short term. Obviously, it's, it's, it's more logical to look at the NPV of the externality and price carbon into your supply chain. Uh, and you realize that it's better to be more sustainable as a business model than trying to uh, cut corners and do greenwashing. And, and I think it's a moral impediment, but I think the more society is aware of the externality and the, the, the damages that we're doing to the environment, the more the consumer will exert pressure on these businesses and they'll realize that the two can be compatible. But I do think we need to be real uh, around the fact that not all businesses will survive and will be fit for the transition by 2030. I think we're going through a, a Darwinian process of evolution by natural selection of, of how sustainable your business model is. And, um, and it's almost like a, a creative destruction to some extent to, to make these businesses more sustainable. And that transition will be uh, painful. Uh, but I think it's a collective responsibility from the regulator, uh, investors, uh, consumer, to sort of uh, stamp out, uh, stamp out um, greenwashing. Thank you very much. Finally, Jen Huey, greenwashing. So I'm, I'm going to sort of address the two parts of your question. The first is, is it a risk? Very clearly, it is a reputational and regulatory risk that can lead, in many cases, to financial risk. Is, it, is there a moral or ethical duty? I think this is, I think that's a really interesting question because I think what it slightly exposes is that there's not necessarily an agreed or shared understanding of what greenwashing actually is. And if you ask different people in different markets, they'll give you slightly different things. Mm. If greenwashing is only the making of misleading statements, I would boldly say as a former lawyer that there is a whole raft of regulation that already covers the making of misleading statements across a whole range of different financial attributes. Greenwashing is just one of the um, manifestations of that. But clearly, when it's entered into common usage, it um, has taken on a life beyond simply that. And I think if you want to turn this into a, a, a if you want to solve the problem, you first have to be clear about the problem, the, the, um, the problem statement. In terms of the companies that we invest in, I think it's important, and actually we're seeing this a little bit in the US now, that this doesn't result in knee-jerk repricing of ambition. We want companies to be realistic and, and, and measured about their targets, and we want them to tell us how they're gonna get there, but we want them to have targets and ambitions. We don't want them to say, as you're seeing with some of the industry alliances now in the US, to start to crumble and under pressure because, oh, you know, it was, it was, very, it was a very easy thing before, but now it's, very difficult and I've got all these difficult legal challenges. That is, I think, in a way counterproductive. So to, to, to Sasha's point, I think a realistic um, and honest approach to greenwashing and net zero ambitions is to be very clear about 
what the dependencies and limitations are on your current um, approach, what you need support for from government, what are the limits of the in financial instruments that you're running. Pa just to give one very simple example, passive and active are manifestly quite different in terms of how you allocate capital, how you conduct all these different activities. It, there's nothing, one is not better than the other, but it is incumbent on the industry to be very clear about what it is you think you are able to achieve from the seat that you have. And I think the final point around sort of the financial sector specifically, and I think this is why Sasha's work around the ISSB and TCFD and others is so important, is because it's very easy for financial institutions to inadvertently walk into greenwashing because of data gaps in the underlying companies that we invest in. Because ultimately, the, the records and the claims that we are representing are aggregations or portfolios that we are running on behalf of those clients, whether, whether they be insurance, lending, or, or investment portfolios. We need that consistent data set. We need that consistent comparable disclosure to be able to put that data out and then be able to say, this is what the shape of it looks like today. Thanks very much. Final well, formal just, word yeah, just from you, to, Sasha. I just want to say something positive. I mean, if we, if we really do, um, the, when we do any of our surveys, and you know this, when people want to buy these products, they're, they're selling well. They want trust and credibility. So if we get more integrity, and it is an industry that's grown quickly, and I think we will get that, and we're doing all the testing, we'll do our labelling, because at the end of the day, you've talked about it, there'll be huge opportunities for companies and investors to make money out of this yeah. Darwinian yeah. change. And I think that's what we want, and we want that to happen, that investment in the UK. And we'll try our best to give that trust and platform that then the markets can roll ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, well, team, thank you very much for the formal bit. Uh, I think you've given us lots to think about there. Great responses. I'm now going to turn to the audience to see. We've got about 10 minutes for some audience questions, uh, if they'd like to put them to the panel. Um, I think I've got a little bit of a technology issue here, so probably not coming up on my iPad. So I'm going to look out the room. Do put your hand up, please, if you've got a question you'd like. Gentleman down here, please. If so, bring a microphone if we can. Just down here, please. Just here, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you all. Very interesting conversation and, and um, uh, some great comments, especially about Mike Tyson. <laughs> um, so my question and picking up on the um, point about being smart, what specific things can the government and the city do to maximize global access to green finance and um, the associated benefits to UK PLC? J just tell us who you are and where you're oh, from. I'm Charles Yates from CMY Consultants. Lovely. Thank you very much. Who'd like to pick that up on the panel? Don't all rush at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a, there's a whole host of uh, green products uh, and green finance on the listed side of, uh, of uh, the market, so you know, different ETFs or that are readily accessible to, to investors. Uh, you have uh, a bit more sophisticated uh, funds who have dedicated mission statements uh, in terms of sustainability investment or climate investment, etc. So. The problem is making sure that um, they do what they say they do, and that's where greenwashing, et cetera, is important. So I think it's going to be uh, working with the financial industry, the asset management industry, to make sure, making sure that we have a diversity of products that are available so that we can attract investment. Uh, we talked about the pension fund uh, access to uh, a more risky asset, for example. But one thing I'll say, and, and, and I think this is crucial in my opinion, is really not to de, de associate the goal, which is net zero, and this is a physical problem. So we are looking to reduce emissions. We are talking tons of CO2, and then the, 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 the money aspect of things. So you can spend 100 million into a project, and if at the end of the day it doesn't reduce a single ton of CO2, you haven't really done anything when it comes to net zero. So I think we probably will need to, in the same way as if you go to a supermarket uh, or you take a, a, a plane ticket, they give you the CO2 tons that you're emitting in, in, in the atmosphere. I think when it comes to finance, we also need to probably 
get that level of transparency of your contribution to the fight against climate. The other thing I would say on that, though, is that at some point we're going to get to a point we're not going to talk about green finance. It's just going to be finance because everything's going to have to be green. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. Or we have not made it, right, by 2050, and none of us will be in good shape by then. So for a lot, you know, you've seen what's happened in New York. Everywhere. It's just not going to be a pretty scene. So I think, for me, I would like to come back to governance. We haven't, the word has not been uttered today. We haven't talked about governance. But governance, embedding the right governance within corporate, corporates in the UK is going to be what's going to take us there because this is the only way that we'll know that companies are actually you know have a, a proper system to deliver greening you know their output their behaviors their their their, um, uh, their operations because yes we'll need obviously to to capture carbon and we'll need new technologies but we also need to rethink business models and I think that is really where we need to start everybody needs to every entrepreneur needs to look at their business how do I impact nature and how does nature impact me? Where will I be in 2030 when there's less water? You know, we need to think about it. It's in six years' time. And some of these processes take a long time to get put into place. So I think it's really important that people really grapple with that. And we talked a lot about carbon, but not enough about water, which is the other side of carbon. So I think we need to really review those issues quite candidly from a corporation point of view, which is why the disclosure is critical because when the regulator asks questions, these questions are meant, meant to make you think about what you need to do. And I think this is the symbiotic relationship between the regulator and the corporate sector and finance. We need to work together, the three of us, to really help bring this and make this a reality that finance becomes green. And therefore, we also need to make green pay. If green doesn't pay, nobody's going to do it. It's the city, right? And it's Wall Street. Nobody's going to do it. So we need to kind of rewire the system to do that. And how do we do that? I think there's two really key things and easy things we could do, is, which I think are in process uh, for some of them. Stock exchange can easily add into their listing requirements, you know, disclosure, nature disclosure. That I'm pretty sure will come at some point. Um, and because no company, I'm also an ex-lawyer, nobody wants to release elsewhere. Um, it's too painful. The second thing is we need to see more linkage between exec compensation and potentially the whole company's compensation so everybody is incentivized to find solutions, to improve their little department and work with the next department so they can come up with new ideas. Um, we need to link exec comp compensation to, um, to green KPIs, climate KPIs or nature KPIs. That's the only way. And not by 5%. Nobody cares about 5% hit. 30%, 40%, 50%. If the crisis is as serious as it is, we need to take serious measures. And these two small changes could actually accelerate the transition in a really meaningful way. So I think we, you know, we've got a lot of tools at hand, and these two tools are governance tools. You know, governance can come to the rescue here and help the regulator you know, navigate and help drive you know, impact and, and results. Thanks very much indeed. Sasha, final point, you wanted to come back just, on um, Just very briefly to your specific question, we had eight of the largest mortgage providers in the room to help them because they're competing very hard, quite rightly, on green mortgages, which is one of the big things for their net zero commitments. We're trying to help them get some consistent standards, credibility and how they can help. So there's an example of trying to help the industry help itself and then go out and fight each other. Thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time uh, to take any more questions, but I'm sure you'll agree it's been an excellent discussion. First class panel. I want to thank uh, my panelists, to Sasha, to Steph, to Koku, and to Jen Huey. Please put your hands together, give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>